Hi there everybody, this is Mary Kirby with Flight Global's Runway Girl blog and once upon a time Boeing intended to offer wireless in-flight entertainment on the 787 Twinjet. Now the company ultimately decided to go in a more traditional direction with embedded IFE, but Talus and Panasonic are the two companies that have been tasked with bringing wireless IFE to the 787 and they know a thing or two about the challenges and constraints. So I recently had an opportunity to visit with Panasonic Avionics in its uh, headquarters in Lake Forest, California and I talked to their executives about uh, what we can expect and I have to tell you that I got a real education and I hope that, uh, I hope that this proves informative for you too as we get ready to head to the the Airline Passenger Experience uh, Conference and Exhibition in Seattle, co-located with Aircraft Interiors Expo next week. I can't wait. Check this out. So this is our Wi-Fi lab. Yeah. And, and we originally constructed this lab for the Boeing triple, uh, 787 airplane. Originally, when, you remember the days mm -hmm. when Boeing intended to make uh, a completely wireless airplane? Yes. So in, in pursuit of that and all the engineering uh, investigation, we put this Wi-Fi lab together that went by the wayside. We now use it for our connectivity services, and so you shouldn't have any telephone service here. This is where we do all our testing for, uh, we run our satellite network into this Wi-Fi center. We have our own WAPs in here. We have our, our PicoCell and cellular phone, and we can do testing through here for customers as well as our, our labs. So what, what's the difference between then and now in terms of wireless IFE? In terms of what you were able to do for the 787? What kinks needed to be worked out? Well, there's still, there's still things to be worked out yeah. in terms of delivering a streaming uh, video service to, to uh, passengers because you have different um, browsers that they're operating on. And then the, the real question gets to be is, how do you deliver the high value entertainment, early window content? Yeah. You need to make sure that you can satisfy the studio's needs for security and encryption, and then being able to have a DRM that allows a kind of a, a, a timing so that it uh, the capability to, to operate the, the movie then uh, elapses after a certain amount of time, whether it's 24 or 48. So I think those are some of the issues that we're working through now with uh, the content owners. What about uh, right now, it, you know, there's a lot of discussion about just how many passengers can be supported. Yeah. What, uh, what are you, are you, I mean, are you guys ultimately looking to be able to offer it cabin-wide? The biggest but, challenge with being able to offer it cabin-wide boils down to the physics of it. Right. Essentially, to do what we did on the 787 required that we controlled both sides of the equation, both the client and what was being delivered from the WAPs. So we had specialized antennas that had very, very specific footprints, and right. the seats themselves had custom, fairly substantial antennas to be able to pick up on that and transmit also at very low power. Your iPad, your iPod, my phone, all of those, they all play in the wireless space, but they don't necessarily play as well or as quietly, if you will. So you run into problems with interference. Right. Everybody who's telling you that they're going to be able to get 200 passengers on an aircraft. Right. Not at the kind of bandwidth that people are used to right now. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's, that's one of the big challenges. Different devices using different levels of 802.11, whether it's a, a G, an N, an A. I mean, so those are the other things that, that we're looking into and how do you get the most efficient use of that with the different channels as well as the different devices. So. It's all pretty interesting. It's interesting. We also have a lightning tester. That was courtesy of the 787 program. Basically, for a composite aircraft, we had to worry about, you know, on that aircraft, you don't have all the classic grounding structures that right. you do on, a, on an all-metal aircraft. So we had to be able to handle you know, high-intensity radio frequency energy from, from lightning strikes as well as the, the electrical so that you're, energy. That, so that the IFE equipment would be able to handle it? Basically, either handle it or, if it fails, fail in a graceful fashion. Okay. Um, the last thing you want is, you know, you get a lightning strike and you get smoke in the cabin would be a bad thing. So right. That doesn't happen. Right. That anyway. Ooh. Most of the system is set up outside. Only the unit that we're actually putting under test is inside. And, of course, you've probably noticed it. this is a great place to see how your voice actually sounds without all the cool echoes going oh, on. Oh, yeah, wow. So, uh, but it works the same way for radio energy. So... We do a couple of things, like I said. Basically, this one, I think we're probably setting this one up for, for doing um, radiate energy testing. So we have an antenna that's essentially sitting a, a specified distance away, measuring what the, the level of energy that this is putting out is uh, when it's in operation. And when we run it through a full duty cycle, all the sorts of things that you would expect to see while it's in operation to see whether or not it it meets the curves that are, are provided to us by the airframe manufacturers okay. in terms of 
you know, we can't break squelch on certain frequencies. If we do, we have two choices. We can either go and, and figure out where and how it's breaking, breaking squelch, as it were, yeah. and try and and clean it up so that it doesn't put out as much radio energy in that in that band. Or we go to the airframe manufacturer for a deviation. Typically, these days we're not asking for a lot of deviations. We right. used to have to you know, before we really started to do this in house when we were still out out of house. Um, it's a lot easier now. So, so do you do it also with kind of um, personal devices, electronic devices, using your in-flight connectivity doing system? Testing. Yeah. TPET testing actually happens more in, a, in an environment where you've got a whole system okay. and where you've got, a, again, a, a similar room to this, something like our, our, our test lab that you were just in yeah. where we had the 787 equipment set up. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's the sort of place where we would be able to do some level of TPET testing. Uh, if, if nothing else... Uh, one of the things that we've, we've actually looked at when we did the 787 work, in addition to doing the IFE itself, we wanted to see what would happen if a lot of people had their laptops on at the same time. How badly would it interfere with the system? Right. And that drove our choice of what spectrum to work in as well. That's why we picked 802.11n uh, and 802.11a for, for certain other parts of uh, the system rather than working in you know, 802.11b and g. Right, and it right. Was, it was something that, that made a big difference in terms of just whether or not we could get close to or meet the bandwidth that we needed to do. And then the timeline for that was there were, you, there were still regulatory hurdles to pass with that, that wasn't, wasn't there? Yeah, the, 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 the fact that it added weight yeah. to the aircraft above and beyond what a wired system would have was, was not the only thing. There were also some regulatory issues. There were some issues in particular with, with countries who essentially said, you don't have all 13 channels to work with. You've only got these channels to work with. Yeah. And if you start to run out of channels, because one of the things that we had to handle was if we got pinged by, if the aircraft got pinged by a radar that was in a, uh, running across a particular band that we were working in, we had to sh switch to another channel dynamically to wow. avoid breaking squelch on the channel that was being used by that radar in that area. And we also had to pay attention to it geographically as well. So there were some places, China was one in particular, where we could completely run out of bandwidth. And that's something that you have to worry about to a certain extent in, in any sort of wireless technology is, sure. are you going to be able to get that regulatory cert and what channels are you going to be able to use where you are? You know, you, you can't necessarily use all the channels. One of the major reasons we were able to do channel reuse on the 787 was, again, because we had such very tight beams and very, very low power, we could still deliver content in a small area without having to worry about this channel interfering with a channel that was halfway down the aircraft. Okay. In a standard wireless system, that's the reason why you're limited to four or five WAPs at most, is after that you start to run into to problems with, with your channels start to interfere with one another. Oh, that's so interesting. It's the high-level view. 